Last time I spoke here on this property, uh, there was a little house there and I sort of spoke outdoors to a group of guys, I think. They were packed all around the place. So it's a little bit different today. <laughs> uh, it's very exciting and we praise God for the realisation of the vision that he gives and then brings it to, to pass. Often takes a bit longer than what we hope for, uh, but uh, this is our God at work. Uh, last year was a, a time of significant change for us. We sold our large family home of 25 years and set up in two new residences. We built a house uh, with one of our sons and had a granny flat in that. So we set up this, this granny flat and we also uh, set up a unit up at Caloundra uh, as well. So it was a lot of change for us. They say that the moving house is the third most stressful event coming after the death of someone you love uh, and divorce. It becomes before serious injury or anything like that. I don't know why, but that's what the research says. So, so as you can imagine, last year was uh, quite exciting for us, but also quite stressful for us. We had a lot of help uh, with that. We moved in with family, which is sort of not completely new. We'd said goodbye to them and then we moved in with them. This is the dreams that parents have, isn't it? Uh, we did keep two bathrooms in our granny flat, so Debbie doesn't have to share a bathroom with me and my mess, uh, so that's been quite a marriage saver as well. But there's been a lot of adjustments uh, in a different situation living. We can't offer our house for, for things that are on now because we only have a, a small place. It's exciting, it's been fun, but it's been a challenge for us uh, as well. And that's what change is like. I want to talk about a major change that's coming to the church uh, this morning. As you might have already picked up by the song we've, we were sang before the, the sermon, it's about, it's about revival, about God reviving his church and God working in power in, in our community. And before you say, wow, that'll be fantastic, that's what we're dreaming of, God working in power, uh, remember that the revival, as God revives his church, it brings significant change. Uh, for us, it won't be life as usual. Uh, if God's going to move in greater power, then our lives have to change to to go along with that. We'll have different priorities and passions. We'll have different uh, wishes in our lives. Uh, it'll be challenging for us. It will create some stress for us as well. Uh, and this is significant cost that we need to weigh up before we say, yes, Lord, bring revival. May you work on your power. Remember that it's going to be costly for each one of us uh, as God moves in, in greater power. God changes always like that. But let's face it. Uh, what we have at the moment isn't all that great, is it? <laughs> like, we live in a beautiful place and God's been good to us and most of us here have been drawn into his family by his grace and what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And We celebrate all of that. We celebrate the fact that Australia's benefited uh, through the resources that we have, even through COVID and all the rest, you know. So, so there's many wonderful things in our lives. But, but frankly, spiritually, we're in a very, very difficult environment, aren't we? Like it, it really is hard to be passionate for Jesus, to, to live for Jesus, to, to enjoy Jesus, to celebrate his love, to, to talk about Jesus. Like, like it's just a hard environment for us. And if God moves in revival power and the presence of Jesus becomes so much more real in our lives, then that's going to be good. <laughs> I want to look at Isaiah 40 uh, this morning. In this passage, Isaiah is prophesying a change that's going to come uh, to God's people, the Jews. Actually, in, in Isaiah, he prophesies two, prophesies two major changes. Uh, for the first 39 chapters, he mainly prophesies a very tough time coming up for the nation. Uh, they've turned away from God, they have not obeyed him, and so God is going to let them be uh, decimated uh, and governed by other world powers. Uh, they're going to be, people from uh, Israel are going to be taken right throughout the world uh, by these great powers and nothing much is going to be left. And so for the first 39 chapters, not completely, there's some little good signs in them in there, but generally it's about God is going to bring change to this nation 
and it's going to be really, really tough for you. And then in chapter 40, the chapter we're going to look at this morning, uh, he changes tack and he talks about the time that comes after that, after this very, very difficult time. God is going to move in new power. It's going to be a new season for the nation. They're going to be desperate, but God is going to do some miraculous things uh, and he's, he's, his glory is going to be seen. <laughs> And that's what he's, and so he turns, and chapter 40 is kind of the turning point in a way. And from then, the next 26 chapters are focusing on this, this brand new season that's going to be after the tough times when God's going to move in, in great power. And so that's what I want to have a look at. So let's read, we'll just read the first five verses to start with uh, and look at this passage this morning. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. This is Isaiah 40, verse 1. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that a hard service has been completed, that a sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The ground, the rough ground shall become level. The rugged places are plain. All of this is preparation for God to move in his power. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So when did this season of new blessing uh, come for the people of Israel? Or God's people. Well, it's complicated. Uh, clearly, this passage is referring to the return of these exiles back uh, to Jerusalem. We find uh, in verse 2, it says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her. So something's going to happen in Jerusalem. And this is what Isaiah is, is prophesying. As a result of their sin, the Babylonians particularly come and they decimate Judah and they uh, destroy Jerusalem, and they take people captives and plant them, many in Babylon, but right throughout the, the empire of those days. And, and Isaiah is prophesying here that there's going to come a new season. It's going to seem impossible. This nation is finished, but they're going to come streaming back from all over the world. They're going to come back to Jerusalem, and there's going to be a new season of, of blessing, of God's glory being seen uh, by the nation. And, and Isaiah is referring to this. He's saying, hang in there through all the tough times coming. Hang in there because there's something new coming. God is going to do a new work uh, among you. It's going to be a new season, a new start. But there's more. He's certainly referring to that in the prophecy. But have a look at verse 3. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Now, is that little phrase, that sentence familiar to you? In the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. All the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they all refer to that quote <laughs> directed to which person? John the Baptist. In the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. And so what Isaiah is prophesying here is not just 200 years time from when he's speaking to say the nation's going to return, it's a new season. He's talking about another new season as well. The new season when Jesus comes to this world and he lives and he dies and, and rises again and, and returns to heaven and the spirit comes and the church is born. Like This is going to be a new season for the church. God's going to pour out his spirit. The glory of God is going to be seen in new ways and God's people are going to be blessed and become a blessing to the whole of the world. Jesus initiated a new kingdom, a, a new season <laughs> uh, for, his, for, for his people. And so this passage obviously refers to that. But it goes more than that. It's like I feel like one of those salesmen on TV. But there's more. Like, like there's more. Look at verse 5. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. Now what's that a reference to? That didn't happen when they returned to Israel. All people didn't see it together. That didn't happen, happen when Jesus came. All people saw it together. When is that going to happen? Well, Revelation 1, 7 says that's going to happen when Jesus returns. Everyone is going to see 
the glory of Jesus as he returns to this world to set up his kingdom here, fully established forever and ever, a kingdom of heaven and earth come together. Like, like that's still in the future. He's prophesying something that's going to happen well into the future. At his time, at least we know, because it happens, hasn't happened yet, at least 2,700 years time. <laughs> He's prophesying something uh, into the future, a new season. So, so this prophecy by Isaiah is not just referring to one historical event. That's what I'm trying to show. That happened two and a half thousand years ago. It's, a, it's a, a series of events, a series of God working in great power, a series of new seasons for his people uh, that Isaiah is referring to. It's a little bit like my retirement. I retired in 2017 from principal of the college. Then I also retired in 2019 from my interim role as uh, as pastor at Brackenridge Baptist. And then I also retired at the end of 2020 from my role as director of the Queensland Baptist Movement. And I'm still not completely retired. It's still coming up somewhere in the future. And this is what this is like. Like, like it's not just one event that God has in mind when he gives Isaiah this prophecy. It's a, it's a rolling series of events as God pours out his power. As he says to his people, enough is enough. I'm going to pour out on you a new season, a new season of power, a new season when my glory will be seen. So this movement of God is, is coming in waves. So the question that I have is, well, when's the next wave? Now, when we look at the spiritual apathy of Australia, of, of this community, you kind of get the feeling the new wave's a fair way away, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's so much for God to do for, for him to work in great power in this nation. Well, not necessarily. Uh, I've, we've got a place up the coast, and we often have family visiting. It's funny how they love to visit us when we're at the coast. And, uh, and so I've often got grandkids down the beach. And I love the surf. And I, so I'm trying to introduce them to the surf, you know, that surf is a good thing. But, but they're scared of the waves coming in. And for a little one-year-old, like waves are very powerful things and they, they push you over and, you know, they're, they're, they're frightening. And so I, when, they're, when they're in that very young age, I, I keep a real watchful eye on them when, the, when they're in the surf. Because in their mind, they think when the water recedes, the waves go back they think, oh, they're gone now. I can walk down. Now, I know that that's not true. I know that when the waves go back, that's only because there's a new one building up. And if they wander down chasing the wave, they're going to be in big trouble. I know that if the waves go back for a couple of kilometres, there's a tidal wave coming. <laughs> but I don't tell them that. So maybe... The fact that the wave's gone back spiritually in Australia may just be the sign that something big is building up, that God is about to move in greater power than what we've seen before. There's a guy called Mark Sayers. Some of you might know of him. and uh, He's an Australian pastor and influential right throughout the world. And, and he firmly believes this, you know, that... that that the spiritual apathy of our nation is just a sign that God is about to do something very powerful uh, among us. So when is, when is it going to be? This is what you're all wanting. Do you know what I mean? Like, like when is it going to be? Well, Isaiah, when he prophesied this, really had no idea. He wasn't thinking, well, I'm prophesying for at least three things here. You know, this is going to happen. And then he, he's got no idea when, when it's going to happen. But, but God is speaking to him. And so he's saying... This is what God says. This is what God promises. Uh, this is what God's going to do. And, and similarly, we can't be certain. We don't know the, the times. Uh, a wave is building. Uh, maybe that could be the ultimately the return of Christ. Do you know what I mean? The next wave could be <laughs> Jesus coming back. I'm not sure. But what he says in this passage is, is we need to get ready for this. <laughs> get ready for the wave. Get ready for the new season. A voice of one calling in the wilderness where it's tough and where it's difficult. Prepare the way for the Lord. We need to prepare. 
But it's easy for us to be skeptical, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Because there's so much dryness around us. It's easy for us to sort of think, well, yeah, I'd love to see God work in power. I know it's costly, but, I, but I'd love to see it. But gosh, it doesn't look likely, does it? Do you know what I mean? So, and, and it's going to be the same when, I, when people read this I pray, uh, prophecy of Isaiah. Do you know what I mean? When they go through the really tough time to say, oh, God's going to move in a new season. He's going to draw his people back together again and going to work a new power and it's going to be fantastic. And they're just sitting in Babylon thinking, well, Buckley's have this ever happened? Like what chance is there that God could do that? So, so in this chapter, uh, chapter 40, Isaiah gives us some, some encouragement to say, hey, You've got to believe this. You've got to hope for this. You've got to dream for this. You've got to prepare for this. And uh, so let me just quickly look, uh, give you two reasons why we can be sure that we can trust God for this. And the first reason is this. Because our God is powerful. A danger for Israel was that when they went through the tough years, they would think that God, their God was not powerful enough to do anything to protect them anymore, to help them anymore, to support them anymore, that, that God couldn't do those things. As they looked around them and saw the world powers of their day, fantastic, mighty empires just walking all over the top of them, it was easy for them to think, well, our God really can't do much about this, can he? Well, listen to what Isaiah says. I'm going to read a passage, and it's probably up there on the screen too uh, as well. This is from verse 12. It'll just take me a few minutes just to read this, but just get the feel of this. Let it wash over you. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations, the empires, are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon's not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They're regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each one of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. What the Israelites saw was huge empires flexing their muscles with them, the little Israel, caught in between. But God is much bigger than that. These great powers were moving, were dancing to God's tune. They're a drop in the bucket, he says. Where are the Assyrians now? They're gone. Where are the Babylonians now? Gone long ago. Where is God now? Continuing to move in his power. The last 500 years have seen Christianity have a very significant and mostly positive influence uh, over the West. Our Christian values, particularly the significance of each individual to God, has been embedded in, in our culture and in our legal systems. And for a time recently, it looked like It looked like Christianity, uh, Christian democracy anyway, Christian freedom, Christian values were going to be dominant right throughout our world. This is no longer the case. Whether it's our concern about Aussie values, the values of our country, or whether it's our fear of the rise of autocratic powers, major powers like China, obviously, and and Russia. But it can appear that that God is kind of losing the battle here. He's losing the battle in Australia. He's losing the battle in the world as, as people who try to follow him seem to diminish in strength and those that are opposed in various ways seem 
to gather momentum. That's just not true. The nations are like a drop in the bucket. Empires and political powers will come and go under God's hand. And if God says that it's time for a new wave of blessing for my people, then nothing can stop it. In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, Isaiah says. We need to believe that our God is powerful. We need to hold on to this. We need to know who he is. So easy. It's so easy in our lives to reduce God to the ups and downs of our lives. So when we're going okay, God is powerful. And when we're not going okay, then God doesn't seem to be able to do much. And we just got to get outside that, beyond that. I've been trying to do that in my prayer life more uh, just recently. And and spend time in praise, just seeing who God is and worshipping him for that. Like what Isaiah does here. And, and then in the light of understanding who God is, then to pray. <laughs> and say, God, you are like this. Okay, here's the things that I want you, that I think you want to do to extend your kingdom. So we need to believe uh, our God is powerful. If you don't believe he's powerful, then... <laughs> Prayer and expectation of God moving in greater power and revival is not going to come to you. God is powerful. The second thing we need to do, uh, it comes out here, we can believe for this because, because our God is tender. We often get the picture, if we get this idea of God's great and he's powerful and he's moving stuff around and he's ultimately in control, he's sovereign. If we get that picture, it's easy for us then to think, well, we're not all that important uh, to God. And it would be easy for Israel, you know, in the light of what was going on, the big nations moving and flexing their muscles and all the rest, they'd think, well, yeah, God can be in control of that, but, but obviously he, he doesn't care too much about what happens to us. And, and this passage is just saturated with the tenderness of God, not just the, the power, the sovereignty of God, but the tenderness of God. Let me give you some examples. Verse 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Uh, verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Verse 29. He gives strength to the weary increases the power of the weak. It may seem like, like God is like a chess player, kind of moving the pieces around uh, as it suits him. And, and you're a pawn, you know. You're one of the little pieces that can't make much difference. So you're going to be sacrificed if that need comes. Do you know what I mean? To, to win the big game. Well, that's not the picture here at all. <laughs> the picture here is of a, of a shepherd looking after a, a young flock and small flock and, and you're one of those sheep that God hugely loves. And in your weakness and in your ordinariness and, and in your brokenness, God intensely cares about you. He cares about all his people. This, this new wave of God working in power is, is not just because God decides it because the world needs it. It's because God wants it for you. <laughs> he wants this for you. He wants to pour out his goodness and his, his blessing and his grace and his love on you in new, fresh ways. I love verse 31. Many of us know this well. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not be faint. This is what he wants <laughs> for you. Recently, uh, I was sitting in church doing my grandfatherly duty, looking after two of my young grandsons and their mates who seemed to gather around them. And I was sort of trying desperately to keep them quiet and uh, make sure they didn't destroy the church. And I was fighting a losing battle, really. It was, of course, the mates, not my grandsons. But, you know, it was, 
it was, it was pretty tough going. They were not, you know, they're two and three and four, you know, so they're not interested particularly in what's going on and I'm just trying to keep them quiet as best I can. In front of me, in the seat in front, was another grandfather and I didn't know this guy real well but, but I knew that the, he had a little granddaughter in his arms and she was six months old and I knew it was her, his first grandchild. So here am I with these boys ripping all the place to bits. And, and here's this, this grandfather in front of me with this little, beautiful, precious little girl in his arms. And like, he's besotted. He really, I could just see, he's besotted, you know, over this little precious girl that he's cuddling in his arms and, and loving her intensely. And, and I did think about it at the time of, for about two seconds. But in hindsight, I look at it and think, you know, often we think that God's more like what I was like, you know, what I mean? <laughs> trying to keep us under control and get us to do the right thing and telling us we're not doing it well enough and all the rest. And, and it's just that God is far more like the other grandpa. <laughs> like he's tender. He really is. He, he, lo- and he loves to hold you uh, in his arms. He loves to pour out his love on you. And, and part of why we can believe for a greater, power, more powerful work of God, a work of revival, is because he's tender and because he just loves to do these things. I pray that uh, with Isaiah there's a, there's a hope burning in you. The purpose of this sermon this morning, as we look at this passage, is, is to help you renew your strength. <laughs> Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. The hope of, of new power, of fresh strength, of, of walking, of running, of maybe even soaring spiritually. Of God working in greater power in you and, and in this community and in this nation. And yes, it'll involve significant change and yes, it will be costly. But oh, to see the glory of the Lord revealed in greater ways. And I guess I'm asking you this morning to prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. It's a dry place. It's a hard place. Prepare the way. Get it ready. Prepare the way. Believing that, that God is sovereign and powerful, that nothing is too hard for God, that nothing will, can stop the work that he will do. Believing that God is tender and loving and, and just wants to pour out his blessing on his kids and many others as well. There was a guy called uh, Campbell Morgan who was a, a British evangelist and pastor beginning of last century. And this is what he said about revival. Revival cannot be organised. But we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. We can set our sails. (laughs) A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, set your sails. (laughs) In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we don't know when, where, how, Lord. And maybe, Lord, this revival we dream of, we pray for, we hope for, we prepare for, is actually your return, Lord. Maybe that's getting close. We don't know, Lord. But Lord, we dream and pray for a new season. New season for ourselves, Lord. Where, yes, it'll be costly for us, Lord, but where we can soar spiritually, Lord. Where we can live close to your heart. Where we can share with you as we do with a friend, Lord. Where, where you become more important than anything else in our lives. We long for a new season, Lord, for this church. It's partly a new season with the building, but this is a spiritual season we're praying for, Lord. Where you work in greater power, where many, Lord, are f- 
find you for the first time, where backsliders, Lord, are renewed in their faith, Lord, where there's repentance, where there's new commitment and new hope and new power, Lord. We pray for that. We pray for our nation, Lord. Oh, Lord, this place, such spiritual dryness, Lord, of materialism and secularism. Oh, Lord, and and fading values, Lord. Oh, Father, we pray for this nation and cry out for this little place, Lord, that you and your tenderness and your goodness might pour out your revival on us and we will see you, the glory of our God, Lord. We pray for these things. Lord, we prepare the way. (laughs) We set the sails, Lord, so that when the wind blows, Lord, we'll be part of all that you want to do in us and through us. We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus. Amen.